The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant says radioactive water has leaked out of a treatment facility and it may have spilled into the Pacific Ocean. Spokespersons for Tokyo Electric Power Company say workers may not have reacted quickly enough. The spokespersons say workers detected slightly elevated levels of radioactive cesium in seawater around an outlet from a gutter. Workers found at least 45 tons of water had leaked from a device that removes, uh, removes salt. The water also contains radioactive strontium at levels that could pose health risks if someone were to ingest it. I'll alert the media. Workers had last checked the water treatment device 21 hours before they spotted the leak. They found no problems. TEPCO spokespersons admit workers did not do enough to contain the leak because they assumed the water would stay within the building. I really wouldn't know, sir. I'm just a servant. TEPCO will take about two weeks to complete its analysis. On the other hand, go screw yourself. Tokyo Electric has shown where it's processing compensation claims from people affected by the Fukushima nuclear accident. The office is in Tokyo. 5,000 workers accept about 700 compensation claims from individuals and companies every day. The company is under pressure to speed up the work as the number of claims it gets each day is likely to grow. When the mainstream press and the government says nobody could have predicted this, they're lying through their fucking teeth. The world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases is taking a longer-term view of climate change. China's representative at the UN Climate Conference in South Africa doesn't rule out accepting a greenhouse gas reduction target after 2020. His stance may affect the course of discussions at the conference. The vice chairman of China's National Development and Reform Commission, Xi Jinhua, says his country is ready to discuss what it can do beyond 2020. China has so far refused to accept any mandatory emission target. Negotiators at the UN talks are trying to come up with a new framework on global warming. They're discussing what to do after the Kyoto Protocol expires in 2012. China's Xie says scientists need to verify whether industrial nations have actually fulfilled their emission reductions under Kyoto. Japan, among other nations, is calling for a new framework that would include China and other major emitters. We humans throw a little dash of stupid into everything we do. Kevin Camps is with Beyond Nuclear. BeyondNuclear.org is the website. Uh, the Fukushima China Syndrome and the architect of Reactor 3 are warning of more to come. Plus, there's leaks going on. Kevin, welcome back to the program. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. Uh, if my wife would let me use my Geiger counter, and if I was to go down to the, uh, to the, uh, to the supermarket and find some fish that originated from Southeast Asia, as so much of it does, you think I might find some radiation? Well, you know, actually you need to do special tests with much more expensive uh, radiation monitors and uh This is almost 400 bucks. Equipment. Yeah, I hear you. It but, catches um, cosmic you radiation. Find the, the internal contamination in those fish, which is almost certainly there if they're coming from the uh -huh. Japan uh, okay. East Coast, is to do an analysis in the laboratory, which our federal government, which has the resources, has the equipment, has refused to do from the beginning. And then you're going to start to see the internal contamination. Yikes. Okay. So what's going on with Fukushima right now? Well, uh, some very disconcerting news. Uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company, nearly nine months after the meltdowns took place, is now admitting how bad they actually have been. So in Unit 1, which was the first to melt down, they're saying is probably the worst of the three reactor meltdowns. They're admitting that there has been very deep uh, melt through of not only the reactor pressure vessel in Unit 1, but also uh, deep into the concrete primary containment structure. And they're admitting that there's only a foot and a half of concrete left before the final layer of steel. And then it's a pretty short course into the environment, into the soil, into the groundwater at that point. And uh, bear in mind, this is all a computer simulation by Tokyo Electric Power Company. So what kind of shenanigans they're playing with the computer modeling. But they're admitting that they are very close to the final steel barrier to prevent uh, penetration of the earth, which is, by definition, the China syndrome. And my recollection of the China syndrome, so basically, in English, what we have here is a molten mass of, of white-hot 
radioactive material that used to be the fuel rods, you know, sitting on the floor of the reactor and burning its way through the floor of the reactor. And then it'll burn its way through the steel, it'll burn its way through the concrete underneath, and it'll start burning its way through the rock until it hits a, la a layer of water. And since this is right next to the ocean, that's probably not more than 5, 10 feet down. And when it hits that layer of water, it's really hot, the water's really cold, you get something called a steam explosion, and it just blows the hell out of the whole thing. Uh, do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. The, the architect of Unit 3 at Fukushima Daiichi, a former president of Saga University, uh, so impeccable academic credentials, has said that it's just a matter of time before the molten core, at least in Unit 1, if not also Units 2 and 3, does reach groundwater. And then if, it's, uh, if it just hits it right and there's uh, enough water and enough molten core, you're going to have a pretty powerful steam explosion. So yet more catastrophic radioactivity releases in a great big hurry, but you've also got just the chronic uh, flow from this site into the ocean, for example. So, you know, even the decontamination system, which is supposed to be taking radioactive contamination out of the cooling water, which is massive in quantity, they're admitting now that they have leaked tens of tons of radioactively contaminated water from that system into the ocean. Right, where it gets into the food chain, and ultimately it ends up in the fish, and it ends up in my restaurant, and maybe... Uh, in a quiet corner of the restaurant, Louise will let me take the Geiger counter out and measure the fish. Um, we'll see. But um, the a question, uh, the, the, the Chernobyl melted down. I mean, there was a full core meltdown, was there not? There was uh, more than one massive explosion and then a fire that burned for 10 days. Um, and so, yes, there was a, a massive meltdown, too, that um, so, they were finally able to stop before going any deeper. So how, how, did they, nitrogen. how did they stop the melting core at, at Chernobyl from melting down through the earth and hitting a water level? And why can't they do the same thing at Fukushima? They, at Chernobyl, they brought in hundreds of miners from Siberia, and in an emergency operation that was round the clock for I don't know how many days, they, they drilled a tunnel under the Chernobyl reactor building, and they poured massive amounts of liquid nitrogen into the ground to freeze the ground, to freeze the groundwater, and prevent the molten core from reaching any deeper. And so that's a good question at Fukushima. I am not a geologist, but I imagine the proximity to the ocean, very different than Chernobyl, may have complicated such an operation because, like you said, there's a lot of groundwater, and there's even the ocean right there. So how they're going to get under the reactor in a great big hurry. But they've had nine months to figure this out, and so yeah. the professor uh, from Saga but, University... But they can't get this said, stuff out. It's not like you can go in with a... With a, with a dump truck and just pull it out. I mean, any, any scoop you put in to grab that molten core, it'll melt right through it. Well, yes, and, and at Chernobyl, they got under the meltdown is what they did. They got out right. in front of it, so to right. speak. Right. And, uh, and they can't do that around. here. But so how many, yeah. we've got six reactors at Fukushima. We just have a couple seconds, Kevin. Um, six reactors at Fukushima. How many have had meltdowns? How many of these might end up with China syndromes? three of them, units one, two, and three, and then you got the high-level radioactive waste storage pool at unit four, more and more evidence that there was a fire and catastrophic radioactivity release from that pool. Wow. So, and each one could be a Chernobyl, essentially. It's approaching Chernobyl in scale and has yeah. matched it and exceeded it in terms of certain radioisotopes, xenon-133, the releases have been You're greater. listening Hold to on. the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. That's amazing. Kevin Camps, beyondnuclear.org. You can get all the information there. Kevin, thank you for being with us. Thanks, Tom. Well, we've all heard of gross domestic product, but what about gross domestic happiness? The day may not be so far away. The Japanese government is creating a new index that measures happiness. The Cabinet Office unveiled plans for the Happiness Index on Monday. It would evaluate people's well-being through three benchmarks, their household wealth, physical and mental health, and community and personal relationships. Each of the benchmarks would be quantified through data such as child poverty rates, suicide figures, perceptions on family ties, and fears about radiation. Experimental data collection is to start next year. The Himalayan nation of Bhutan already uses a similar index to measure gross national happiness, while the OECD is working on an international standard to gauge quality of life. Humans are fucking stupid. We 
we have been throughout our entire history, and we remain so today. If there ever was just one word to describe humanity, that one word would be stupid. What I am saying here is nothing new. Human stupidity has been a great source of entertainment for us humans for as long as humanity has existed. It is a major cash cow for those smart enough to take advantage of it, and just so happens to be the guiding force behind most things that happen in the world. We take pride in our stupidity, and we labor endlessly to invent new ways to capitalize on our stupidity. We humans throw a little dash of stupid into everything we do. We love being stupid so much that it sometimes hurts. We have always been stupid, and we always will be. And you know what the bitch about it is? It is all our fault. We have no one to blame except ourselves. We, being the stupid fuck-ups that we are, have abandoned the ability to think for ourselves, and instead given that responsibility to people who are often more stupid than ourselves, so that we get to work our shitty 9 to 5 jobs and live our stupid lives without the stress that comes with the ability to think for ourselves. We want to be numb. We want our brains to be on cruise control 24-7. We want our opinions to be cooked in a spoon for us, and we want our thoughts to be given to us intravenously. The masses are all junkies just waiting for the next opiate.